Hi, welcome to On The Fly, the show that takes you to local fly fishing destinations. I'm your host, Lee Smith. Tonight, our special guest is Frank DeGrazio from the Angler's Den. Frank is a licensed New York State guide and also fishes many of the waters here locally. Frank is going to give us an overview of the east branch of the Croton River, where to fish, what flies to use, and other tips and tricks that will make your trip a success. Frank, how are you doing? Good, how are you? All Thank right. You. What can you tell us about fishing the, the east branch of the Croton? Well, the east branch of the Croton is a tailwater. It's part of the New York City uh, drinking supply. And we have about seven or eight rivers in the watershed itself. And the east branch of the Croton runs in Brewster all the way down through Croton Falls. There's two sections, an upper and a lower section. The upper section from Brewster down to Diverting Reservoir is open all year round for fly fishing. And that's the most popular section of the river. And we're going to just talk quickly about equipment, uh, a five, um, five weight, nine foot rod with a weight forward line, a five, six reel, four, three reel will help you. Um, you want something that's short because there are a lot of overhanging trees and, and bushes. Base, your basic setup leader system uh, from Rio, a nine foot, six X uh, leader, which is 3.4 pounds you will use 5x and sometimes 7x in those smaller flies. You always want to have some tippet anywhere from 4x to 7x which you will add and put on uh, attached to your leader to make it a little bit longer or if that one gets cut down. Also we have a few different styles of indicators that we use while nymphing. We have just a small cigar shaped indicator here uh, a small thingamabobber that we put on the line, a football style indicator, okay, uh, a yarn indicator which takes those subtle strikes and you'll able, able to see them. The first thing that we're going to talk about, Lee, is nymphing. And nymphing is using the small juvenile uh, insects that live in the rocks and under the water. And when we're nymphing, we're using a few different type of setups. We're going to use an indicator on there. We can use uh, some split shot with, with that indicator to get our flies down and deep. Or we can use weighted flies as this golden stone fly. Uh, has a lead under wrap with a tungsten bead and it helps us get down. When we're nymphing, we basically want to look for any type of water where fish, is, fish are going to hold. We want to look for pocket water, deep cuts, some runs, and depending on the type of water, the different type of indicators we can use. We want to cast upstream, drift it down into our perfect lie, usually a five by five foot area where we think the fish are holding. Uh, we will watch our indicator anytime that indicator moves, stops, goes in another direction. We lift and set the hook and usually there's a fish on the end. Great. Okay. Another tactic that is really successful around here is dry fly fishing. And dry fly fishing happens when the juveniles are rising from the bottom and they're starting to emerge. They're shedding their exoskeleton and they're coming up and they're sitting in the film or just below the, the surface of the water. And we like to use a lot of different flies that will sit right in that film. As you can see, we have a selection of dry flies in the front and we want to target rising fish. Whereas nymphing, you're looking just fishing fishy areas. When we're dry fly fishing, we're looking for those active feeding fish. We'll see different types of rises. We might see a little boil where they're feeding on those emergers, mm -hmm. okay, right as that insect comes up and gets stuck in that film where it's trying to shed. Or you'll see a big splash and the fish come out of the water. They're, fit, they're feeding on the duns that are floating downstream. But we want to cast upstream of our target and we want to get it to drift right in front of where that fish is feeding with a tight line with no drag on it. So you need to position yourself upstream. If I have a clock, I want to, if the fish is at 11 o'clock, I kind of want to be between 1 and 2 o'clock so I can get that fly down right in, right in his feeding zone. When the evening comes, spinners will fall, which are the, the, um, oops. The adult uh, mayflies, they're ready to spawn. So they mate, the females fall down with an egg sac, 
and that's when we use those spinners. Those spinners will sit right on, and that usually happens around dusk. You don't actually have to find an active feeding fish. The fish will feed opportunistically during that time. Okay. So you can throw a spinner uh, right before dark pretty much at any time. As long okay. as you see them flying around, they'll start dropping, and the fish will just feed as they come, come through. The last tactic that, that we use is streamer fishing. Streamer okay. fishing is imitating any juvenile bait fish, um, any tiny crustaceans that, that might be in there, crayfish, and we want it actively fish to those fish. We want to fish deep runs, slower pools. We use a poly indicator, which is a weighted uh, piece of line that has some steel in it, and it helps get our flies down to where those fish are. It's a good tactic, high water, uh, early season and, and late season where those fish are really actively feeding and trying to uh, fatten up, especially for the, the winter time. Okay, some tactics that we talk about and that we use. Stealth, especially on the east branch of the Croton. Uh, it's a very pressured river, so we cast before we even get in the water. We don't want to step in before we've checked that area out. The fish will come towards the bank, especially during feeding time, and they will sit in six inches of water a foot off the bank. So you really want to pay attention. The water is usually pretty clear. So you really want to look at where you're fishing and, and you might be able to sight fish to some fish. You really need a good presentation. Uh, you need to get those nymphs down without any drag. You need to make sure that those flies are going before the split shot. You need a quality presentation with your dry flies making sure that there's no drag, which means the line pulling across the water, creating a ripple. Okay. And with those streamers, you need good imitations. You need olive woolly buggers, you need uh, white woolly buggers. Uh, they need to be weighted down to help get down. You can use those leaders, a tiny short little strip to trigger those strikes. These, these fish are fished to every single day, so a quality presentation is crucial. We'll talk about flows. Uh, you and I were just talking before the show about the flow how it is today. Right now, the river's unfishable. That's why we're here tonight. <laughs> That's it. But right, the flows come out of the dam and is controlled uh, by New York State and the power companies. And the flows are measured in cubic feet uh, per second. And we want to make sure that those flows are good for fishing. The average flow for this time of the year in, in the beginning of the summer is usually around 100, which is very good. It's a very comfortable flow to fish. You can wade. Um, very comfortably, you don't have to worry about going in too far. Uh, 100 to 125 is, is ideal, it's okay. perfect. 125 to 150 is, is my favorite because it's a little bit higher, so those fish are a little bit more spread out. You can get a little closer to them where you don't have to be as stealthy as in that lower water. So as that, that number gets higher, the water gets higher and they, they spread out, they actively feed in that, in that uh, flow. When you start getting over 150 into the 175 and 200 range, it's starting to get really high. Right. It's good. It could be good fishing during during a hatch, uh, when we call that catastrophic drift, when the flow pushes all the bugs in the river and pushes right. them down, and the trout just start swimming towards the banks and in those soft seams, and you'll have good fishing. But it can get a little bit difficult to wade. There are a lot of rocks, branches, trees, things that are submerged that could make wading a little bit difficult. Anything over 200 to 225, I wouldn't really advise. It could be a little bit dangerous. Um, right now it's 400, so we can't go in the water. Gotcha. But it, it can be really dangerous. There's a lot of submerged things that, you know, the, the flow and people don't realize that oil takes is one step and you'll get washed down. Okay. Okay. Right now I'd like to take a look at some of the insects that we have in the river and some imitations that we use. If we can take a look at the uh, blue wing olive nymph which is one of the most common nymphs that we find in the river. They're available all year long, and they range from size 14 uh, to a size 22, okay? And we have a couple of different imitations that we use. Uh, the nymph, olive nymph, if we can cut to that slide. A simple nymph with some mallard as a tail. Uh, we have a thread body. Uh, this one has a little hot spot on the back, which means just putting a little piece of fluorescent thread mm -hmm. on there, and it acts as an attractant. We use a tungsten bead sometimes to weight those down to get them down, but this one just has a tiny bit of flash. We also have the olive dry fly, which are available quite a bit. We also have a picture of that one. 
where they hatch in the mornings and sometimes late in the afternoon on cloudy days, uh, they're readily available. And again, they can go from a size 12, which is pretty big, down to a size 22, wow. a tiny little fly that the fish will, will feed on. We also have uh, a, an abundant number of caddis in, in the river systems. All of the rivers in the system have it. We have a picture of a black caddis larvae. This one was found in February, believe it or not. Um, mm. It was tiny, but it still had time to grow before it started hatching in April. The imitation that I like using for this fly is just a simple little thread pattern with some dubbing. We have a picture of that as well that we can go to with a little hot spot. Mm -hmm. uh, I like tying these without the bead uh, in a size 14 to size 18. Try to get it down with a lead under wrap, but black dubbing and a little bit of hot spot. They're always in, in the water. Another uh, nymph that's there are uh, light Cahill nymphs and sulfur nymphs. They're, they're readily available. We have a slide of a, of a light Cahill nymph that I found in, in March. Uh, this was a tiny one, size 18. Oh. And this is a clinger, and you can tell it's a clinger nymph by just looking at its round, round head. The head is the same width as the body. And we know it's a Cahill from the markings on the legs and on the tail and they're always in the water. We use hare's ear and pheasant tail nymphs to imitate those Cahills. We have a couple of pictures of some hare's ear nymphs. And this one again was found in March. Okay. And it was a very tiny fly that we found in small little tiny hare's ear. This is a size 18. We're taking fish in March on that. And we also have an, another hare's ear picture of just a little different variation. The top's a little different. The color, if we can cut to that slide, Okay, and the next imitation that we like using for the Cahill nymph is a pheasant tail. And the pheasant tail can range from olive nymphs to Cahill nymphs to sulfur. So it's kind of the do it, your, do it yourself, do it your own fly where it's an all around fly. You can use it uh, all year long. Small though, we want to use those in size 14 to size 20. Okay. So they're, they're a little tough. The last fly that we have a picture of is a green caddis larvae. And this one was found in the end of March. And these are always in the water. They're ranging size eight, which is an inch long, all the way to a size 22, which might be uh, two millimeters. They're always in the water. You flip up a rock, you're going to see them. We, we try to use them uh, in our nymphing rigs. And we've come up with many different patterns. That's just one pattern. Uh, that we have. And that's a picture of the nymph itself uh, taken in this past March as well. We also use the adult imitation, uh, which is a tan caddis fly that we like using. That's another fly that you can kind of just throw anytime. And if the fish is opportunistically feeding, they will take it. They're used, they're used to seeing those those uh, adults on the water. And that's an elk hair caddis with a little bit of hackle on it. It rides nice and low in the water and it gets those fish thinking that it's one of those emerger flies. That's great. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last slide that we have is a picture of Trout Unlimited back in, in the 1970s. And I know the vice president that started this Trout Unlimited chapter. And this is a picture from the early 80s of the East Branch of the Croton where they really started to uh, put an effort into making it an incredible stream where it went from a put and take stream where the state stocked it and people came and they fished and they took the fish out to a year round fishery. Uh, the East Branch is open all year round in the upper section and they started stocking fingerling brown trout and within three, four years they had um, 20 inch trout. So. What we try to do is do the same as, as them, and we try to conserve it and do the best we can. Yeah, but great, great. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. are very that, well. That was a great presentation. Yeah. We've got a few minutes here. Let me, let me ask you some questions, some of them which I'm, I'm hoping you probably get on a, on a pretty, pretty regular basis. But I know, um, you know, as you mentioned, in New York State, there's various regulations about when water is made available. Can you tell me a little bit about um, when fishing the starts you know both from the season and from the regulation standpoint and then if there are any special pointers or things that we need to be be aware of as we go through it 
certainly appreciate that as well. Okay, the East Branch of the Croton is a tailwater, so it remains flowing all year long. The water comes from the bottom of the reservoir, so it's typically warmer in the winter time. So it has a pretty free flow. The upper section from Brewster down to Diverting Reservoir is open all year round. Okay. It's one fish at, at 14 inches, artificials only. The rest of the rivers in the watershed will all open April 1st. So you can fish on April 1st and some close on September 30th and some close on October 15th to protect the spawning brown trout. We do have a good spawning population where a lot of the fish are, are becoming uh, wild. We have a lot of tiny fingerlings in there, so they try to protect them by closing them. It's part of the New York City watershed, and it's part of the water uh, supply area for New York City, so you need a special access permit that you can get on the DEP.gov website. Okay. And you need to always have waders on, since it is a drinking uh, water river. You need to always have waders. Uh, you need to be actively fishing. If you don't have your permit, you cannot access it. You carry in what you carry out in terms of garbage. And if you're not fishing or hiking, you should not be on the, on the lands. You can get ticketed and fined. Okay, it. so no wet waiting. No at wet all, waiting. At, at any point in time. No, nope, not at all. Okay, okay, great. I know this changes with, with the seasons, but um, can you talk a little bit about the best time of day to, to be out on the water and maybe give us some insight as to what types of fishing are effective at various times of day? The fishing could be hatch dependent, um, like the Hendrickson's will start in April and they're an afternoon hatch. They will fish, start coming off at 2.30 in the afternoon and when they're going, it's you look at your watch and it's 2.30 and you start seeing those duns coming down. Uh, early mornings are always good, late in the evenings you look for the spinners coming down, but it's really hatch dependent. Um, the Isonychias that will start in a few weeks, they're more sporadically throughout the day just as we talked about the caddis. So you can use those nymphs and emergers and dries throughout the day and catch fish. Olives like cloudy days. Uh, if it's cloudy, the better for any type of fishing. The brown trout really don't like the bright sunlight, they're a low light feeder. and the olives on those cloudy days can hatch in bunches in the mornings and in the late afternoons. So it really depends on what time of the year. Uh, as in right now, I would say for our end of June, July, August, we're looking at early morning to evening time is, is the peak time. Once we get into the fall, late morning, as that water starts to get a little bit cold, maybe the middle of the afternoon. And in the winter time, we want to go right dead in the middle of the day when that really? sun is out okay. to warm up that water one or two degrees to get those fish active. What you said about being cloudy days, that type of, of thing, that, that led me to another question, which is what are, what are the best conditions to fish in? Because there's some people that, that really like the, the blue sky sunny days, and then I notice other times when it's overcast, the river will be loaded up with, with anglers as, as well. So how does, how does that impact when to go fishing and also what, how you're fishing? I enjoy fishing in the worst weather, the better keeps all the, sometimes the anglers off the water. But like you said, the diehards are always out there. Cloudy days are always good because it gives that low light and the, it will make the trout comfortable and they will feed throughout the day on whatever's available to them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those bright sunny days will push those fish. Our rivers aren't very deep, especially if the flows right. are low. So it, those, that sun will push them into the shadows and they might be under a tree branch and they might be tucked under a log and, and it will be really hard to fish for them. Those are the days where you wait until the sun starts to go down. But the cloudier, the better. Okay. Uh, day after, uh, nice sun, warm. Water warms up a little bit early in the season. Next day is cloudy. That's the day that you want to be out fishing. Great, great. I know that a lot of us associate trout fishing with the East Branch. Um, but from what I understand, there are other species in there too. Can, can you speak a little bit about, about what, uh, what other types of fish are found in the river and, and how you might go after those? We found uh, carp last year started coming up from the diverting reservoir, which has been the new thing in fly fishing, is fishing for carp. Uh, they will give you a run for your money, especially in a tiny river. Uh, we mostly nymph and use streamers for carp. Uh, they've been found in the slower pools uh, where the sun is, is sitting. They like digging out those little insects from the silt. Uh, Panfish are in there. We have perch, sunfish and we're getting a little bit of a concentration of smallmouth and largemouth bass in there that might fall over the dam and come into the river and they're now starting to naturally spawn. So we, you have a little bit of everything for, for most people, even though the, the heavy fishing is for trout, 
you are starting to get some uh, carp enthusiasts that are starting to hit that water, specifically targeting those fish. Great, great. I know you mentioned the, the special regs, but could, could you just tell us a little bit about what licenses are needed in the state of New York for, for fishing? In general, you, you need a New York State fishing license. You can get okay. that on uh, www.newyorkstatedec.gov, uh, and you can get that right and print it right out. Uh, the resident, non-resident, you can get one day, but you need that license. The DEC will be out checking, and like I said, the uh, watershed permit that you can get on on the DEP website, and that's important. That will give you access to all of the watershed property throughout the entire state, not just here down in the Croton system. Okay. So you can use that down in Westchester on a hiking unit. You can use that on fishing units up in the Catskills or hunting units. So that, that permit is good uh, for five years and you can use that across the board, which is nice. Great, great. I know early on that, that you, you talked a little bit about equipment. Um, what I'd like to, to ask you is, is, you know, for people that are just getting started, you know, what do you really need to, to really get this, you know, to, to get started and, and to have a, a good setup that would allow you to, to fish dries, fish, fish nymphs, and, and also fish, you know, streamers mm -hmm. as well? Well, uh, a five uh, weight, <coughs> nine foot rod is ideal. If okay. You, you can go a little bit shorter because we do have a lot of overhanging trees and a lot of obstruction, so it does make you casting a little bit difficult. But this is a great all around rod. I can use dry flies on this rod. I can. Uh, European nymph style. I can indicator nymph mm -hmm. with this rod, uh, with a five weight uh, weight forward floating line. This line will float. Uh, we attach a long long leader. Um, the setup does not have to be expensive. It just needs to be something that you can cast well and that's comfortable in your hands. You need some tippet, uh, some split shot, some flies, and an indicator, and you can go out and fish. A That's bag cool. or a pouch to keep everything, a pair of snips and some forceps to get the hook out. You can, you need a net um, and a pair of waders. Good pair of polarized sunglasses will also help for you to see in the water, not only to see fish feeding, but to see any obstructions that are there, rocks sure. and, and branches and that sort of thing. And just dress for the weather. Appropriate rain gear if you want to go out on those cloudy days. Uh, I always recommend to everybody a long sleeve shirt because we do have a, t a tick issue here in in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, try to spray down, you know, with with some bug spray. But the long sleeves will will help you protect you from the ticks and, and the bugs because you'll be walking on trails and through brush. Uh, and a hat just to, to keep you shaded and any sun gear that you want. Some people wear sun gloves that you would wear down in the Bahamas uh, in okay. Florida when you're saltwater fishing. Uh, they also have buff head gear where you can pull it up to try to block the sun from your face. But any sun protection is always always good and, and to help you. Any preference as far as, as the neoprene waiter versus you know what I'll call the more traditional waiter? Yes, the breathable waiters uh, has been the way to go because you're walking and constantly hiking and you want a waiter that's going to breathe so you're not going to sweat underneath and it's more important I would say during the colder months because as you're walking and moving around you're starting to sweat and now that's how you get cold and you, you need to protect yourself from that so the breathable waders allow for the moisture to go the neoprene will trap them in they might keep you a little bit warmer if you're not hiking so much and you're mm -hmm. just going to be in one spot uh, you can get the three millimeter, you can get the five millimeter neoprenes that will protect you, but the breathables are the way to go. You want something with at least three layers on it, and you'll see that it'll say three layers in the need to protect and, and on the inside seams because you will get a lot of punctures from anywhere from thorn bushes to sticks to rocks that you don't see if you sit down on a log. Mm -hmm. You can poke a tiny little hole and you don't want to have leaky waders, especially in December especially and January. In December, you got it. You got it. Let me ask you you, you, know, you, you guide for a living and I'm sure you have regular clients that have been with you for years now and I'm sure you have people that this is their first time. When it's someone you know, for their first time, what are some of the things you would tell someone before they came out to spend some time, spend a day with you or spend some time with you? I always make sure that they have the right licenses. Uh, I'm doing an intro trip to fly fishing tomorrow, so New York State license, watershed permit, uh, pair of waders. They don't really need waders. We have them uh, through our shop and rental equipment we have, and that's it. They really just need license, sunglasses, and a hat, 
and and I'll take care of the rest and we outfit them and, and we go through the same things that we just talked about sure. a little bit quicker in the car ride <laughs> and, and taking a look and, and getting set up getting rig, rigged up but mostly to just looking at the water and reading the water seeing where the fish might be right. uh, different access points where you can go into the water legally and make sure that you can fish where you're not trespassing and just the different rules and regulations of each body of water and the species that we're fishing for. And most of the water in this area is pretty well marked, is it? Yes, yes, especially on the DEP lands there's signs all over the place and uh, most in New York State uh, you're okay as long as you're below the high water mark and you can see the high water mark in a river by where the the river is at its highest, you need to stay below that. There are some places where you will see no trespassing, where the property owner does own the stream bed. If, if that ever happens and you stumble across that, I just would suggest getting out of the water and going back the way and to go around their, mm -hmm. their land on the street and then hop back in the water. But you really need, it, everything is pretty well marked in this area. Oh, great, great. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Final question that I, that I have for you is, got some great equipment here. You pointed out the sizes and stuff like that, but for someone who's shopping for, for reels and rods, aside from, from the actual you know, five weight rod, which you recommended, is there anything about the actual equipment you can say to look for? So, so you know, either in the size of the grip or the reel seat, that, that type of thing. Yeah, you want, want a graphite rod, an IM6, seven or eight, which is the, um, the quality of the graphite. Mm -hmm. You want something, this is a Gray's GRXI rod. It has a strong butt here, and if I had the tip, it has a very flexible tip where I can roll cast uh, and regular single hand cast. And it, it has a lot of power in it where you don't need to really whip it around to get it started. The line will take that energy from your hand and it'll transfer it to the rod. So this is a, a good rod to have. Uh, I recommend this to a lot of people starting out. It's fairly inexpensive, but it, it will help your casting, especially for the, the newcomer. With a, a reel, you want something that's a quality metal. You want something that has a sealed drag where you don't get debris and that sort of thing. And if we just take this off, and you can see the red area where that's all sealed. So I can't get any dirt and rocks and sand in that because these will get wet. They will True. go in the water, and you want to keep all that stuff out. Right, and what do you normally do? Let, let's say for whatever reason, you're either playing a fish or you, you drop the, in, in the river. What do you typically do for cleanup afterwards or, or do you have to do any to it? I always wash everything down, whether I'm fishing in the fresh or the salt. You don't want to bring any invasive species to anything else. Okay. And you really want to soak it down pretty good with a hose, uh, especially you know, when it's the summertime and the bacteria levels might be up a little bit, there might be some algae in there. Uh, and that goes for all your equipment, your boots and your waders. Right. You can clean your waders right in the shower, just wear them in, scrub them down with some soap. And your boots, the same thing, you just use a little dish soap to clean them and just make sure that they're dry. You don't want to dry them directly in the sun and in a cool uh, place where they'll dry naturally. Okay, very good. Frank, thanks again. Th this has been a great presentation, very informative. We're just about out of time now. I once, once again want to thank Frank DeGrazio from the Angler's Den for joining us and giving us an overview of the East Branch of the Croton River. Thanks and have a great evening. Thank you.